dedication, hard work, self-sacrifice. That's Larry Bird. Nobody, nobody does it better than Larry Bird. Hi, I'm Red Auerbach. Along with Larry Bird, we're going to show you what it takes to play winning basketball. Over the years, the game has changed. Used to have the two-handed set shot, went to the one-handed shot, the jump shot, the hook shot, the sky hook, various dunks, or whatever. But one thing has never changed, and that's fundamentals. Fundamentals are fundamentals. Remember, all you're trying to do is take a round ball, stick it in the hole more times than the other guy. Winning is great. It's great to be a winner. Remember, if you sacrifice and you play hard and you win, you go all summer long with your chest out. I was a member of a winning team. That doesn't mean that if your team doesn't win a championship, that you can't be a winner. You can, but you've got to be willing to pay the price. You've got to work hard. You know, when practice is over, you take some of these fellas, they just go home. But the great ones, they'll stand there and they'll shoot. And they'll work on individual skills. Now, if you're willing to pay that price, you're going to be a fine, fine basketball player. We're going to show you what it takes to become a good shooter. It's a lot of work that goes into that. And the most important thing in shooting, after you learn the techniques, which you'll see now, is not to practice from too far. See, because then you get into bad habits. A shot becomes a throw. When I was a young kid growing up, I can remember guys as, at a young age of about four, five, six, seventh grade, something like that, everybody wanted to make a half-court shot <laughs> and stand out there all day doing that and never get nothing accomplished. And uh, three-point lines the same way. Kids want to become three-point shooters instead of the, the basic 15-foot or 10-foot shot. When I go out and shoot around by myself anywhere before a game in the summer, I always try to start out about 15 foot from the basket and work my way around the perimeter just so I can get loose and then uh, maybe go a little bit further out or a little bit closer. What I try to do, just come out and get good rotation on the ball, get the back spin, try to get a good release, and I always focus my eyes on the rim before I shoot the ball. I feel if you don't do that, it's like shooting at a moving target. Larry, right, hold it a minute. You were talking about different things about shooting. What about your balance? Balance is very important. What I try to do when I shoot the basketball red is keep my, my feet planted towards the basket or somewhere close. When I shoot the ball, when I'm warming up or just out here, if I have a wide open shot in the game, it seems like I always have my right foot forward. And when I go to release the ball, 
I use this as balance more so on this, and this is just to get me up on my, my toes when I shoot now, it. And you bend your knees, right? Right. I think that's very important. Now, it's is, hard that, to... is that according to distance or according to just natural? I think it's distance. The further yes. you're out on the court, the, the more bend you're going to get, the more mm -hmm. ump in your, your takeoff. But uh, I think that it, it's very important to have a good balance, and, and you've got to be down at all times. You give you some flexibility. All right. Now, what about when you shoot the ball? What do you do about holding the seams or the backspin? Why, why do you do that? Well, I try to get my fingers uh, into the seams every time I shoot the ball. It's not possible every time, but uh, if I got time, somebody throws the ball, if I got time to make the adjustment, get my fingers on there, I think it's very important because uh, one thing, the distance, I feel the further I'm out on the court, if I get my fingers in there, it gives me a little something to hold to push off. I also feel that I can get better rotation on the ball, which I think is very important because if you get good rotation on the ball, if it hits a rim, it's going to bounce around, give you that extra bounce maybe up there to fall in. That's what they talk about, you know, the good shooters seem to be lucky shooters, but right. there's a reason for it. That's true. The other reason I like to uh, get my fingers into the seams is because if I don't, it feels like a beach ball to me. It don't feel right. The ball don't, does not feel very good in my hands at this position. Uh, Just, now, what do you do with your, for example, your head? My head is always, my eyes are always planted on that rim. You don't watch you the ball. Never watch the ball. It's all okay. feel. I think consistency is real important when shooting the ball. I try to have the exact same motion each time I take my shot. As I bring the ball up, my elbow is in, my wrist is bent back, I push off with my middle two fingers, and I follow all the way through, extending my arm and wrist as if they were going right through the basket. Larry, when you shoot the ball, how far back do you bring it? Well, I take it up to the side, Red, where I can see it out of the corner of my eye. The one thing that I've always learned, if I brought it back any further than that, it's more of a throw than a shot. So when I take it up, I feel more comfortable if I just take it to the side of my head and just follow through. If you take it too far back, what happens? I don't have really no direction of the ball. I don't really know where it's going to go. It's more of a throw. It's, of course, me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Don't mess with success. You don't have to be a picture shooter. No matter what you do, as long as it works, stick with it. Larry, when, when you shoot the ball, you very seldom take a jump shot. Why? Well, the further I am from the basket, the less I want to jump because I think uh, I have to have good balance in my feet. I have to have, be able to be planted and go up. I really don't get that much air time, but uh, I do just get enough to, to get the ball up over the rim. But if I'm in the lane uh, 13, 12, 10 foot and somebody's on me, I do have to jump a little bit higher. But I, I'd rather stay on the ground because I'm not a, a great leaper, but I think I can get away with it out on the court if I keep my feet planted and keep good balance. A lot of people think the bank board is just to hold the rim and net in place. But remember, the bank board can be one of your best friends. I feel that there's a variety of places that you can place the ball off the backboard easy enough for the ball to drop in. As shown here, there's four or five or six different spots that I can place the ball in the same area and you can still go in for two. Every time you look at the backboard, remind yourself that the back of the rim is only six inches from the backboard. So all you have to do is touch the board. It's an added plus, it's a big plus. Use it wisely. All right, hold it. The most basic shot in basketball is the layup. Now you can shoot it with your hand under the ball or you can shoot it with your hand over the ball. Always remember, you don't throw the ball. You've only got six inches between the backboard and the rim. All you've got to do is touch it. Use the hand opposite from the foot that's on the floor when you jump. And when you jump, you jump straight up. And you do that by throwing your head up. And you jump with your left foot, and your right hand will throw it. Always remember, be careful about being cute. That is coming down and spinning the ball. Coming down and throwing the ball. Or coming down and using a finger roll. That's the worst thing you could do. Let the Michael Jordans and the Dr. J's they can do it. They got the big hands and they're professionals. But always remember, a layup is a layup.
If you're free underneath the basket and you can dunk the ball, don't fool around. Just stuff it in. Players today, every once in a while, get carried away and they want to have showtime. They want to play to the crowd. So they slam it hard and a lot of times it hits the back rim or it hits the front rim on the side and pops out. Remember, what you're trying to do is score. You should always take the open shot. If you know you have a good shot, it's your job to take it. When conditions are right, I'll even take the three-pointer. I'm always confident that if I practice my fundamentals, my ability will come through under pressure. I figure I can either make the shot or create an opportunity to score by taking it to the defense and get fouled. Foul shots are often called free throws. That's just what it is, a free throw. Now, Larry, you've just been fouled. You got two of them. What goes through your mind? Well, the first thing I like to do is relax. After running down the court for two or three minutes, you get a little bit tired and you don't want to step the line real quick because you do have plenty of time to shoot them. So what I like to do is take my time, step the line, relax, block everything out, and just concentrate on that rim. I always take a couple dribbles, mess with the ball a little bit, then go down, bend my knees a little bit, and relax. Now, wait a minute. I gave you two free throws, you made one, and you stepped back. Why did you step back? Well, I always feel that a guy that shoots a free throw and stands on the line is just adding pressure on himself. What I like to do, I like to get away from the line, go through all my, my thinking again, wait till the official gets through arguing with all the coaches, all the players, regroup, come back to the line when the official's ready to give me the ball and start all over again. I think I'm a better free throw shooter because of that. Larry, right, when you got these two free throws coming, does it ever go through your mind, uh, the, the score, or you might miss one? Or what? I never, ever think I'm going to miss. Every time I walk to the free throw line, I always add up two points. Well, I'm going to tell you something. When I sit in the stands and you're playing out there, I look at the score, I automatically <laughs> add two. I'll tell you that. That's added pressure. <laughs> <laughs> great shooters are not always great scorers. The reason being, just because you can shoot doesn't mean you know how to use a screen. Doesn't mean you got that real great hustle. It doesn't mean that you know how to fake and faint and get open for your shots. But a great scorer usually has both. Let's watch it. DJ has a ball about 15 feet from the basket and sees me open underneath, but I've decided that I have a big man on me, so I go outside, fake the outside shot, get the defensive man leaving his feet, take the ball into the basket, seeing that there's two or three defensive players standing there waiting for me, guarding my right hand, I take the ball up left hand and bank it off the board. Ball fakes are a very important part of the game. I like to use them to release defensive pressure and make them stay back off of me, or make them either get up close to me so I can make a quicker move going left or right. Some of them that I use, I like to fake right and go left, or I like to fake left and go right. The one that I like to use the most is a head and shoulder fake because if you don't react any quicker than that, it's always two. Here Dennis Johnson is giving him room. To get him off balance, I have to fake right to get him leaning that way so I can go left. I take one dribble to the basket and go in left-handed for two points. Here the defense isn't too tight, so I try to make him think with an up fake. And then I give him a hesitation to move to freeze his motion. And then I take it strong in the hoop, driving past him with a running left-handed hook. Sometimes ball fakes is not enough to get the open shot. That's why you need your teammate to set a good screen for you or a good pick. To me, a pick and a screen are two different things. When I, when I think of a pick, I think of myself having the ball and a guy comes out and plants a good pick on the defensive man where I can come off for the shot or run the pick and roll. A screen is when I'm without the ball and I move to get myself open and come off a screen for a jump shot from 10 or 15 feet out. I think it's just uh, things that people say you can't do and you try them. It's, it's a situation where you know you always want to see uh, the one shot or the one pass that's never been made and since I got the green light I'll try anything.
I usually like to ride to the game by myself. I can get more out of it, and it's, you know, it's one of them times of days where you're by yourself and you can think a little bit better, and, and you can anticipate a little bit what you're going to do out there. You know, just like tonight, I know who's going to guard me. I know I can come off the picks and get a little bit better shots. And um, I have, you know, I really don't worry about it. I, I sort of just let my ability take over when the game starts. And that's what happens now. I just go through some small things in my mind, some real minor things. But uh, once I step on the court, I just let my ability take over. Someone has to bring the ball up. Somebody has to pass the ball and get it in the hands of the guys that can shoot it. But the way the game is played today, everybody has to know how to dribble and drive. Everybody knows and should know how to pass the ball. Because if you want to play winning basketball, you can't lose that ball. You got to be a good dribbler. You got to be a good passer. Now let's see how to do it. Here's Jerry Seasting showing you the various techniques of dribbling. Hey, Ray, what is all this? They go between their legs while they're dribbling, even in the ball game. Yeah, a lot of times uh, they do that, Ray, to get away from the defensive man. As you notice, Jerry, right now, he's working on hand speed, and he's working on different situations uh, in case he rises in a game where he has to go down the floor real close to get the ball. He learns how to dribble close so he can get away from the defensive man. As you notice, his eyes are always looking ahead, always looking in front of him, and uh, he's trying to protect the ball. These are different moves you can work on to protect the ball from the defensive player. I guess they do that because after a while, the ball becomes a part of them. That's right. You've got to do these things because you never want to be in a situation where you have to worry about putting the ball on the floor going left or right. You've got to be able to, to think that the ball is part of your hand. Now, this is one of the few team games where you can do a lot of things by yourself. That's right. This right here can be worked on anywhere, driveway at home, basement, uh, just about anywhere in the neighborhood. Uh, these are things that are very important in the game of basketball. You don't have to use all of them during a the game. It, I don't think it's very necessary to go behind your back 50 times during a game or through your legs, but there are some instances where you have to, to get away from the defensive pressure. When you dribble, you must always be aware that the floor is smooth, the ball is round, that it's going to come back up to you, so you don't have to watch it. So you keep your head up, you bend your knees, Keep the dribble low. Use your other hand to protect the ball. Remember, the ball is controlled by the fingertips so that the hands must remain soft and you feel the ball as you dribble. When you're starting to drive towards the basket, the first step makes all the difference. Watch Jerry Seasting fake, and as he moves to go around Sam Vincent, he steps as far as he can to put the ball past Vincent. So he's already beaten him with just the first move. When a player is coming up the court, he needs a lot of skills to get by the defense. Here Jerry Sisting uses the crossover dribble. He knows when he's gonna use this while the defense does not. Therefore, the man who is dribbling has the advantage. Now remember also, that he does this without breaking speed or rhythm. When a man overplays him on one side, he just puts it behind his back without breaking rhythm and keeps the dribbling. Well, here's Jerry coming at Sam, and he's gonna execute a spin move. Now, you must be careful when you make that move because your back is towards four other defensive players, one of whom could switch and cause you trouble while your back is to all those defensive players. All right, let's watch Sam bring the ball up. You notice he went behind his back without breaking stride, just as Jerry did, but he stopped for that jump shot. Now, only he knew when he was going to stop. That's what makes it such a powerful weapon. The defense has to guess when he's gonna stop. Great penetrating guards like Isaiah Thomas, Magic Johnson, or many years ago, the great Bob Cousy. They know that when they penetrate into the paint area, they can either take it to the hoop, or if they draw a man over to them, that is their double team, they can dish it off. But they'll always find a way to take the shot or hit the open man.
Nobody can run as fast as the ball can travel through a pass. Therefore, the best way to beat the defense is to pass the ball. And you don't have to be fancy to be effective. Remember, no pass is a good pass unless somebody catches it. And the most basic pass is the chest pass. When throwing a two-handed chest pass, remember, always step towards your target. When throwing the basketball, when you release it, make sure your thumb's always pointed down and the ball has a little bit of backspin on it. The bounce pass is executed like a chest pass, except the ball bounces about two-thirds of the way towards the receiver, so it bounces up to the waist of the receiver. This pass can be used when you're getting a lot of defensive pressure from a single or double team. To throw the hook bounce pass, you must step around the defensive man so that you get outside of the defensive pressure and throw a sidearm pass to the receiver. Here's something to avoid. As I see Danny Ainge cutting to the basket, I throw him a sidearm bounce pass. As you can see, I threw it behind him and the ball skidded on me, costing us an easy two points. The overhead pass is typically used to inbound the ball or often to feed a pivot man. A variation is a jump overhead pass that is used only when the man is wide open because it is such a dangerous pass. Because any time you leave your feet, you better have a target to throw to because if not, you could get stuck in the air and always get called for traveling. When throwing the baseball pass, it is a very dangerous pass because you just have one hand on the ball. When throwing the ball, it's much like throwing a baseball. You want to throw it in a direct straight line to the receiver. When throwing a long pass full court, you want to throw it to where the man can run it down. You do not want to throw it behind him because if you do, he'll have to stop and let the defense catch up with him. The behind the back pass is made by directing the wrist at the receiver from behind your back. This pass should only be used in special instances such as a two-on-one break when the defensive man has committed himself and is all over the ball handler. He can go behind his back to open up an otherwise tight passing lane. Go! Watch that line over there. Come on. Let's go. Now you've seen the basic speed, passes. Speed, race it, race Here's some speed, drills speed, and some games right, which you could use which are not only effective in teaching the kids, but they can have some fun. This is a passing drill. It teaches you to pass under stress. There's a guy in the middle who's on the defense, the other men on the offense. They can't pass to the guy next to him. It's just a simple drill, but you've got to move fast. This is a long pass drill, similar to a sort of a baseball pass. Have some fun. Your head is up, your head is up. Your head up. When you learn how to dribble the ball, the main thing, even, even passing, the main thing is no turnovers. My philosophy is I like to get the ball in the vicinity of the guy to catch it. I always say once it leaves my hand, there's nothing I can do about it. It's up to the guy that's receiving it. I know. However, he's got to know it's coming. I mean, sometimes if he's out there and you throw it real hard and he doesn't expect it and he drops it, I, I think it's the fault of the guy who threw it not the guy who didn't catch it. In certain situations, but I think if you throw a, a pass to a guy, if his defensive man's behind him and a guy slides around, knocks away and steals the ball, I think that's the fault of the guy receiving the pass. Well, that may but, well be, but suppose a lot of times a guy goes up for a shot, they, right. and he changes his mind. All of a sudden you throw a hard pass at him and it goes off his hands. You, you can't blame the, the guy that, whose hands it went off. You gotta blame the guy who passed the ball. Well, in my situation, I don't usually worry about it. If I go for the shot, it's going <laughs> towards the rim. As a coach, fellas come out for the team. And wh wh what do I look for? Naturally, you look for skills. It's important. But there are a lot of things that you really zero in on, such as hustle. Now, I say, what is hustle? Hustle means you play with great intensity. That ball that's on the floor, it doesn't have any player's name on it. 
Therefore, it belongs to the guy that's going to dig in deep, no matter how tired he is, and go and get that ball and say, that's mine. And he's going to get it. That's why hustle always impresses a coach. Determination. That real, dedicated, sincere look that you're going to give everything you got within you while you're playing out there. Larry, there's an old thing going around for years that you don't make a ball club with defense. You don't get the big salary with defense. And I think that's a lot of bunk. I think if a coach knows what he's doing out there and a guy knows how to play defense, he could contribute to that ball club. Well, that's true because uh, I think uh, from playing on the Celtics that we get a lot of our easy baskets because we play great defense. Once you slap the ball away or you intimidate a shot or, or you get uh, a long rebound uh, or make a guy kick the ball out of bounds, we run off the, the mistakes they make, and defense causes them. Well, your defense triggers your offense. But basically, in playing defense on a man-to-man -man situation, you've got to have determination You've got to be willing to sacrifice your offense because defense is work. It's hard work. And the guy that works so hard, he has to give up part of his offense. There's no sure. question about it. But the guys that go out there and just talk about uh, the defense like from a standpoint of a full court press or a man-to-man -man defense or a two-man trap or all those crazy defenses what does it work that's true you can, um, you can play any defense and win you know the points you made about guys sacrificing their offense for the defensive end we got um, prime examples in our team dennis johnson is a great defensive player he's a ball hawk he gets all over the ball and he anticipates a lot of offensive moves enabling him to make a good defensive play he's able to force key mistakes by the other team because he has Good, basic defensive maneuvers. Here, Dennis Johnson, guarding Danny Ainge, is going to show us how to play good individual defense. Basic defense. There are three to four very important parts you need to know. First is your arm's distance away from your man. Second is your stance, with your shoulders in line with your knees, everything in line with your feet, and you're in a crouched position. The third, the most important, you need to know your man's strength. If he's better going right, you like to push him left. And as he goes that way, you slide your feet or shuffle your feet to try and catch up to turn him back the other way. And as he gets closer into the bucket, you want to body up a little closer to make it harder for him to get the two points. All right, hold a minute. Hold a minute. Uh, Dennis, I was watching you, and I was watching your feet in particular. Do you advocate guarding a man with your feet parallel or would you like the balance where you have one foot forward? Uh, never straight up. I think always your feet, whether you're shading him left to the right, should be always forward, either this way or this way, to control the offensive player. You notice how his back is straight and his head is up, how he's concentrating on Danny. Now that's very important. Also, we like to have one foot forward so you get the good balance and you can move easier laterally. Playing basic defense involves staying in the right position. It's very important that you learn to watch your man, study him, and then be able to tell from his position what type of movement he's going to attempt. DJ will show us how it's done. As he jabs to my right, you take a step back. And to the left, my left, you take a step back. As he pulls the ball back up for a shot, you take one step forward with your, with your body in front of him. When he puts the ball down, you know he cannot shoot the ball, so you back into your defensive position. Sometimes you're not going to be in the position to play the man with the ball. More than likely, you're going to be in what we call a helping defense. That's with the ball at the top of the key. You guard your man out at the opposite side of the key. And what you would like to do is be somewhere near the middle or check up. And if your man breaks towards the bucket, you would like to take one slide back, pivot around, and deflect the ball down. Everybody wants to steal the ball. 
but it can be dangerous to try because more often than not, the offensive man will go by you and get free. Or you might even be called for a foul. Here, DJ describes the right way to go for a steal. As I'm playing my regular defense right here, at no time at all I'm ever thinking about stealing the ball. I'm trying to lead the man into a point of help or the best position I possibly can until that man crosses the ball across his body. And if that happens, I reach out, I flick my wrist without making contact and steal the ball. As a defensive player, you have to learn to react to picks and screens. And this involves communication and the basic defensive switch because the offensive man sets the screen and the back man on the defense calls the switch because he can see the play develop. Notice that DJ drops off Larry to help out in the middle, but that he stays within reach of the passing lane. As I said, pick left, pick left. I think that the back man should call the switch because he can see the play. But Larry disagrees. I think it should be the man getting picked because only he can tell if he can fight around the screen, which should be his first priority because it avoids a lot of mismatches. Well, I'll tell you, as long as you're talking and you have good communication, I'll agree, maybe both systems could work. On the Celtics, we gear everything towards the middle to Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, who are great shot blockers. It takes up for a lot of slack on my part because I'm not a great individual defensive player. I'm a team defensive, team defensive player. Yeah. And um, I think you can work them together. And uh, when DJ's man beats him, I'm there to help him. When my man beats me, Kevin's there to help me. And it's not always all individual. You know, you can work around the team aspect of well, it. Too. You know, you know hey, today when scouts go out, they come back with a lot of X's and O's and the drawings all around there. This play, that play. To me, that's a lot of bunk. If you are concentrating and talking to each other and seeing what's going on, you could stop any play that way. You don't have to memorize the play because they could double cross you That's true. and have a, a reverse. That's right. Once you're geared to go in one way all the time, all of a sudden they put that extra little uh, back door play or something in there, it's going to mess you up. But speaking or talking on defense is a very important part. Robert Parrish is the best I ever played with. He's always talking on the defensive end. He never says nothing on the offensive end, but he's always talking on defensive end to help you out, and I think it's very, well, very know, important. You know, Larry, there's an old saying, when you're tired out there, but you're so good that the guy's got to be out there, you never rest on defense. If you're tired, you rest on the offense. That shows you how important defense really is. Buck Williams is down low post. Kevin knows he's got all kinds of help to the middle. Buck gets the ball, looks. Jerry Sisting comes down to double team. He throws it back out to the top of the key. As the ball is throwing back into Buck Williams, I anticipate the pass, steal it, look up court, see DJ open, throw the baseball pass for an easy layup. Learn all positions. Learn to be a point guard. Learn to be an off guard. Learn to play from the corner position. And there are times when you might go in the pivot anyway, no matter what your size is, if the guy guarding you is smaller. So you gotta learn some pivot play. For example, you got a lot of professionals today that are playing forward, that all of them were centers in college. You have a lot of players playing God, who prior to that time, whether it's in college or professional, that were forwards, and they've got to adjust. So think about that and work on it. Let's talk about pivot play. Who's gonna play the pivot? Who should play the pivot? A lot of people think that the big guy's got to be in the pivot. Why? Because you're close to the basket, and he's going to get the better opportunity to get rebounds. 
I don't buy that. I think the guy to play the pivot is if he feels when the other team is playing man to man that he could take that guy inside and do better. If he's 6'3 and the guy's guarding him as 5'8 or 5'10, he could take him inside, has a better match than two seven footers going at each other. Every time um, an opposing team that tries to run a play against us and we switch out or something and get that mismatch, automatically we try to go right to it. I remember years ago, they had little guys were the leading pivot men in the country. But today, with the importance of this pivot play and everybody double teaming and sloughing down, it makes the outside shooters better. Hey, you became a pivot man. You've been in there a lot lately. Yeah, I try to, when I go down to pivot, I try to draw the double team so guys like Danny and DJ get the open shot. But if they don't, um, with my size, I usually have the advantage of the guy guarding me and I try to take advantage of it. If not, and a double team comes, I just swing the ball around to the open man and uh, we try to get an easy shot out of it. In other words, the pivot play basically should be the focal point because he could come out and set a pick where well, you could have a pick and roll, which we'll explain. Uh, it, it opens up everything out on the court. Kevin McHale's a great post player. Oh, he's, he's got uh, every move. They double, triple team him, but nobody in the NBA can shut him down. The objective for any postman is get down on the box, get as close to the basket as possible, so when you receive the ball, you can take the highest percentage shot you can take out there. So, in the game, Robert is gonna stop me, he's gonna get in front of me, bump me, and it goes something like this. I'm coming down here, I get him here, I set him up, I try to cut in front of him, he slides around, I feel his body right here, my hand goes out, ball, basket. Here's a good example of how faking the pivot can be used to get the defensive man up in the air. Let's hear how Kevin executes this kind of maneuver. Okay, I've received the ball down low on Robert. Robert's a very good defensive player, so I want to make him move. I'm thinking to myself, if I just go up and shoot it, he's going to block the shot. So I'm pushing him here to the middle, making him respect that. Coming back, I'm, right now I'm giving him the head fake because he's in good position. I see him go up. I'm thinking to myself, I got him on the way down. I go up for my jump hook, and that's two points. Robert overplays Kevin to the baseline, so Kevin knows the signal for the ball towards the baseline. As soon as he touches the ball, Kevin spins to the basket for an easy two. If Robert tries to prevent the pass by fronting Kevin, I try to loft the ball over Robert and try to lead Kevin to the hoop. By now, Robert respects what Kevin can do if he gets the ball in his spot in the box. So Robert cuts him off. I see this, so I throw the ball to the middle. And Kevin has the ability to take a fallaway shot that's almost impossible to block. When post players can do all these moves, they become almost unstoppable force inside. I'm starting to feel I have a good position now. I'm starting to widen out. I'm going to start calling for the ball. Here Larry does a, makes a good move to get Danny off him. He makes a ball fake. He comes up high with the pass. I, I receive the pass. I see Danny coming down. I do have the option to kick it back out to Larry for the jumper but I feel confident now in my move. I have a step through, make the defensive man move. I go up, extend, use the board with the jump hook, and two points. When Robert Parrish is in the post, he uses his quickness very well for a big guy. Here, Danny waits for Robert to call for the ball, and Robert, as soon as he has control of the ball, spins around, keeping contact with the defender to go in. As Kevin fights Robert for position, Robert knows Kevin has got to respect both the baseline and the jump shot. So this time he fakes to the baseline even as he gets the ball. Then he spins all the way to the middle for a hook shot. Danny knows that a defensive man will often watch the ball and take his eyes off of his man. So here, as I'm guarding Danny, as soon as he throws the ball, Danny makes a quick move to the basket. Robert sees he has a step on me and dishes it off for Danny for an easy two. When Kevin gets the ball in position, but he draws a double team, he quickly looks back out to see if I'm in good position to take the open shot, and he gets the ball right back out to me. Here, Kevin, after getting his position against Robert, gets the ball down low. 
but he sees that I have height advantage over my man. So Kevin dribbles out, clearing room for me to establish a post position. Kevin sees Danny overplaying me, so he leads me to the baseline for a quick spin to the basket. The pick and roll. You've heard it many times. We're gonna show you how important it really is. How two men can be the major part of any offense. All the good things that can happen with this pick and roll. Let's watch it. All right, now wait a minute. Now you see what he does. Kevin comes in here to set a pick on Danny Ainge who's playing the defense on Larry. His elbows are out. He's got good balance. He does not hit Danny. He sets the position. Larry Bird uses Danny on his move. He fakes here, and then Danny goes into him. That's how the pick and roll must be made. And that's how any pick or screen should be made. On the pick and roll, I got Kevin and Danny. Danny's defensive man, Kevin's offensive man. I got so many options off the pick and roll if it's ran right. I got uh, Kevin coming over, setting a good hard pick on Danny. I'm going to fake baseline, take a couple dribbles. If Robert follows me out so I don't shoot the jump shot, I got Kevin with Danny on his back, and all I have to do is lead him to the basket with the ball. The other options that I have, if Kevin comes over to set a hard pick on Danny, Danny fights over the pick, I come off. Kevin fights his way down to the post. I got a little bounce pass to him to try to lead him to the basket. Another one is, Kevin comes over and sets a hard pick. Danny trails out. Robert follows Kevin. I come off, take a couple dribbles for the jump shot. The other option that I have, which is a good one, if Danny sees a pick coming, he anticipates a pick and jumps out, I fake to the pick and drive baseline for the layup. <laughs> or the man that's sitting in the screen can fake the pick and break to the basket. The last option, which is probably one of the toughest one to do because there's two picks involved, is Kevin comes over and sets a pick on me, Robert jumps out, I can't go anywhere, so I throw it back to Kevin, set a good pick on Danny, roll to the basket, for the layup. Good kick. Oh, there it is. See? Well, now you've seen the offense. <laughs> How do you stop it? Let's watch it. All right, hold a minute. Now, in defensing the pivot, the first thing you try to do is not to give the offensive man the spot that he likes. Robert is guarding Kevin McHale, therefore, he knows he likes this spot. He won't give it all. All right, now, Larry has the ball. Now you go on the pivot. How would you play him? Now you notice he's on the side. See, some coaches always stay on one side. We don't do that. We like the idea of staying on the side until the ball gets in the middle, and then Robert could help out in case anybody's driving through the middle. Now watch Larry where he moves. When he's got the ball there, Robert is here. Now move, uh, Kevin. All right, now he's moving again. Now if Larry gets in the middle, he's got to go over this guy and fight him and take the other side. Now also, come back here a second. Robert knows that if Larry throws a high pass, he'll get help from the offside, from the weak side. One of his players will help out. But if by chance he does it wrong and he gets on the other side, get on the other side. Now all he's got to do is lock him in and go in for a hoop right there, and he has no chance of any help. So that's why you play on this side. You don't give him the baseline. All right, let's go through that one more time. Now watch Robert on this. He's there. He's there. Now watch him make the move. There. Now that's the way you got to pivot. Remember, the first thing you do, don't give him the spot he wants. After that, stay on the baseline side until they get to midcourt and fight your way over and get on the inside. 
Everybody in basketball talks about blocking shots as if they all know how to do it. There's a right way and there's a wrong way and there's no way. We're going to show this to you. That's a block shot. You smacked it out of bounds. They got the ball. We accomplished nothing. Well, maybe a little intimidation, but it's not worth the effort. Let's do it right. Let's block the shot where we either keep it in play or we get the ball. All right, go ahead, Danny. Come on. That's the way. Perfect. Beautiful. Now let's hear what's going through Kevin's mind as he makes the defensive play and gets the block. Okay, Danny needs to make a good move here and go by Larry. And now I'm thinking to myself, I don't want to give this guy the option to pass or shoot. I want to make him shoot. I want to take Robert out of the play. So I'm down. I'm ready to make the defensive play. I see him coming in. I wait. I go up, try to deflect it softly to Larry, and that right there can start a fast break. The important thing in making the block is not to leave your feet until the offensive man goes up for the shot. You have to stay on the ground and only go up when the man with the ball does. When you make the block, always try to control it. Hit it softly. Try to hit it to one of your teammates. Let's talk about block shots. I know you're a very good intimidator and you're very good at blocking the shots. And, and one thing that I've always seen in, in your ability to block shots, yours and Kevin's and Robert's, is when you go up to block a shot, you don't swat it out of bounds. You keep it in play and you try to tip it to one of your offensive guys. In basketball, you, know, you want to play rough, you want to play aggressive with all all of your body, except, except your hands when you're around the ball. When you're around the ball, your hands have got to be real soft and just be touching and controlling the ball. Believe me, it's fun to block shots and I really like doing it, but, but as a player, when you're playing a really high level game, you don't really think about actually blocking the shot. As a defensive player, I think much more about just forcing the guy to take a bad shot. Again, another really important aspect of the block shot is your confidence in your teammates that you can go and block the shot and know they're going to cover right, behind you. Right. And on, on the good teams like the Celtics, they do step in and cover behind you. And there's no way that a guy can be an effective shot blocker unless he's got a great defensive rebounder behind him. Because again, most of the shots, you're not going to block. What made Bill Russell the best shot blocker was his ability to time the shot. He'd watch the offensive man until he went into his move. And then Bill, would perfectly time his action to deflect the ball so either his teammates or he himself would come down with the ball. To be a champion, you've got to feel like a champion. And you've got to make people look at you like you're a champion. Now, this may involve a dress code. You know, wear a shirt and tie and, and have a little class. I think it's very, very important. You could say, well, what does it actually do as far as putting the ball in a hole? I don't know, but it's just something that lifts everybody up, and I think it has a lot of value. Rebounding. You must have the ball. You can't win without the ball. That's how important rebounding is. Let's take a look at it. To get defensive rebounds, you have to put yourself between your man and the basket. This is called boxing or blocking out. Blocking out is a very important part of the game. When I box out, I like to keep it as simple as possible. I like this man that I'm guarding to make contact with my hand or with my body. As he does that, I slide, turn into him, keep my elbows up, because if he goes right, I can ride him out, or if he goes left, I can ride him out. As I box out, what I like to do is watch the flight of the ball. I do never want to take my eyes off the basketball because if you lose sight of the ball, 
and you're fighting him, you never know where it's going to go. But if you watch the flight of the ball, you can tell if it's going to be short or long. As the ball goes up, I want to watch it, put my body into him, ride him out of there. And I do not, I said, I do not want him to push me underneath the bank board because that takes away a lot of your rebounding area. Concentration. If I do not get the rebound, I definitely do not want this big stiff to get it. <laughs> Here I'm looking to throw it into Kevin, but Robert's got him out of position, so I take the shot myself. Kevin tries to spin around Robert, but Robert gets inside, spreads out, and locks Kevin with his elbows, then grabs a ball and quickly brings it into a strong grip. Robert then makes the outlet pass to start the fast break. It's important to block out all the players, including the shooter. And if this is done, your chances of getting the ball increase, no matter how it comes off the rim. If the shooter is not blocked out, he can break to the basket because he knows where it's going. And often, this will enable him to get his own rebound and be in a position to score. Let's talk about defensive rebounding uh, and the outlet passes. Uh, I know you're very good at that. You go up and try to get two hands on the basketball every time and make a turn away from the defensive pressure and make that quick outlet to get the fast break started. Before I get the rebound, I take a glance at everybody on the court. And, uh, and the guys who I'm playing with, they know when I go for the ball, there's a good chance I'm going to get it because i got good hands and I'm a good rebounder. And they know that at, as soon as I start going for it, they can start their move up the court. And I see where they start their move from. I know where they start to move so that right when I get it, I'm looking to give them the ball and give it to them on the run. When you get a rebound, you turn and take out one or two dribbles. I think that's very good because I think that relieves a lot of pressure off of you and gets them guys sort of hanging back. The, the, the one thing that the guards on opposing teams see, if a big man's telling the ball, they're going to run right to him and say, I can steal the ball. If you take out one initial or, or two dribbles and they start coming back, somebody's got to be open and you're very good at getting the ball to the outlet and uh, that's how we start our breaks. I like to play a speed game, and basketball, you know, you know, to me, is so much fun because it's such a fast game. Uh, and you know, when you get that ball, you got to be thinking, getting it up court. You, you never want to bring it in here. You got to just get it and flick it out. Defensive rebounding, like defense, it's concentration and desire. You can't let up when the shot's taken. You have to watch the ball. You've got to make sure your man doesn't get around you. Offensive rebounding is one of the toughest aspects of the game. It's a battle for the ball. The main objective is to keep the ball alive. Often, this will take second, sometimes third efforts. Once you do this, one of your teammates may get the ball and you'll score that basket. As an offensive rebounder, the key is positioning. And for you to be in position, you have to get your opponent, the man you're playing against, out of position. And the way to do that is by faking him, setting him up in one direction so that you can come back in the other direction and now you're in position to get the ball. That obviously happens both ways. I can fake baseline and then step in front here going to the boards. A real important thing when you're trying to get offensive position is to keep your arm on top of his arm. If your arm is underneath here, there's no way you're going to be able to get into good position. On the other hand, if I fake here and then come back here and I'm able to get my arm over the top, then I have a much better chance to get in front and get the offensive rebound. Here, Kevin sees me taking the shot, and before Robert can box him out, Kevin steps behind Robert and establishes position with his arms over Robert's. This puts him in the right position for the rebound. The same technique can be used from the wing. When Kevin goes up, I step around Danny, get my arm in front, and beat him inside for the ball and basket. Here, Robert doesn't keep contact with Kevin, so Kevin runs around Robert and goes in for the tip in. If Robert doesn't establish and holds his position, Kevin can push him out of the basket where it's tough to get a hold of the ball. As I shoot here, Robert boxes out Kevin, but Danny watches the shot going up, giving me the opportunity to follow my shot and get the easy basket. Here DJ takes the open outside shot. I'm on the weak side, anticipating the ball coming to my area. The defensive man is forcing me to go underneath the basket. I never lose sight of the ball. Once I'm underneath the basket, I keep my eyes and my body in position to make the tip. 
as I've said before, rebounding is so, so important because you can't win without the ball. Don't take rebounding lightly. Next to shooting, rebounding is the most important fundamental of the game. Basketball is not a faucet. You can't turn it on and off. A lot of players make a team. Now they say, hey, I got it made. I'm one of the stars. They go to practice. He goes through the motions. He gives you what is called false hustle. And then comes game time. And these things are kind of ingrained in you. And before you know it, they're starting to give a little false hustle and so forth. So the, the thing to remember is you play as you practice. You've got to practice hard if you want to play hard. When you're talking about team play, you've got to realize it's merely a succession of individual skills, individual fundamentals. Take the fast break, for example. You've got to learn how to throw the long pass without curving it. You've got to learn how to run at full speed, catch the ball and put it on the floor or put it in. You've got to learn, whether it's a set offense or even on a break, how to set a proper screen. You've got to learn how to dribble the ball effectively, like when you're going to the basket and you might dish it off. You've got to learn how to take the shot, that is, receive the ball in position to get that quick release. All those individual fundamental skills is what makes a team play. Well, we've just given you the basics of basketball. Not only as a player, but as a coach or even as a fan. It also takes a lot of dedication, hard work, and a lot of luck. And remember, you have to play as a team. And that is winning basketball. I can remember, it's not uh, how you play the game, it's whether you win or lose, that's my motto. <laughs> and uh, you know, you can go out there and, and struggle and not play very well, but just as long as you win. And I know a lot of uh, coaches and uh, say that they're not, it's not important to win, but uh, in my situation, it's, it's my life. I, I gotta win.